Lumea se confruntă cu tot mai multe crize simultane, dar nimic nu este nou în istorie. Se simte însă tot mai accentuat lipsa de încredere pe care oamenii, indiferent de țara în care trăiesc, o au în politicienii care ar trebui să-i reprezinte. Democrațiile sunt cele mai afectate pentru că felul în care liderii lumii libere iau decizii este perceput de public ca fiind unul mai degrabă slab. Prin comparație, autocrații își consolidează imaginea de puternici care luptă pentru binele poporului. Ce au de făcut politicienii ca să reintre în contact cu cetățenii dezamăgiți? Primim răspunsuri de la Jeff Lightfoot, director program Europa, la unul dintre cele mai mari think tank-uri americane. Sunt Cristina Cileacu, începe pașaport diplomatic. Jeff Lightfoot, Program Director Europe at the Center for International Private Enterprise. Welcome to Diplomatic Passport. Thank you for having me. Jeff, the war in Ukraine uh, is underlining once again how important are the democratic values, but in the same time, we do look and see that uh, the uh, European leaders had a rather innocent approach when it comes to Russia. Mm -hmm. What shall the politicians of, uh, let's say, the Western world, in Europe in, in, uh, in specific, uh, should learn from these lessons so far? Well, I think that It's important to learn lessons and it's important to adapt and learn from the situation. Obviously, a number of countries had deep energy and economic linkages to Russia that are now proving to be uh, a, a liability, not only economically, but also strategically. And so I think we're seeing politicians try to adapt quickly on the fly and to become more resilient. And this, I think, is going to create an impetus for a lot of European unity and dem democratic solidarity between countries of Central and Eastern Europe that are very exposed to Russia and countries in Western Europe that might have less energy dependence, for example. And it's also a moment for that European solidarity to not be built in opposition to strong transatlantic relations, but in cooperation with that. It's a moment for greater transparency of business linkages between um, authoritarian governments and democratic governments. We've seen in Germany, for example, and, but not Germany only, Bulgaria and other places where Russian energy linkages have had, frankly, a corrupting impact on democratic politics. That's both corroding the democracies within and also creating dependencies to an external power like Russia. So we also need to look internally, all of us, my country is, is doing the same in terms of money kleptocratic flows that are being funneled through real estate in the United States. We all have to clean up our economies because our, the, we're seeing these interlinkages, both in terms of economics and energy that have, that have frankly weakened our, our resilience against authoritarian powers that are not just challenging us in the battlefield, but also in, in other domains like cyber and economics as well. But if you look at the, the politics as it is now, do people still trust politics? Because we have this example, for instance, of Hungary, yeah. where people, uh, although most of them say they don't like Viktor Orban, they still voted for Viktor Orban because it's, uh, he is representing the stability. Yeah. So what do the politicians uh, have to change in order to attract more people, in order to, to be more trustful when yeah. it comes to the relationship with the common people? Well, I think that that's a question that has to be answered at, at several different layers, probably at the European level, at the national level, and then down at the, the sort of at local governance level. And so we're, at SIPE, one of the things that we're trying to do is we recognize, I live now in Slovakia, is heading in an American NGO there, and as I travel around the countryside, I sense that people feel that the in smaller cities and towns feel that democracy isn't delivering for them, that even their national government is sort of remote, to say nothing of Brussels. And, and many of the EU, the enormous amounts of money that the EU puts into Central and Eastern Europe is not seen as having an impact at the local level. And so that's a challenge for Brussels in terms of how it crafts its regional policy, in terms of how it engages from a bottom-up approach to, to get in citizens more engaged in democracy. The Hungary, the Hungary case is a really fascinating one, right? Because Um, he won just an enormous majority. Of course, the, the system electorally was heavily skewed in his favor. But you do run into a lot of people who feel like that his message on, on immigration, uh, on the war, was, was frankly quite effective. And many, they're very effective at pushing economic benefits and subsidies in a way that benefits citizens. And so, and, but we see then, you look at France, it just had an election. There's this enormous division between people in, in sort of urban cores and in the periphery that, that, that frankly get a lot less benefit out of that. And of course, everywhere in my country and across Central Europe, people are struggling with rising costs of food, uh, of energy, which is going to put a lot of pressure 
on budgets because there's a, there's a huge imperative for the European Union and the United States, uh, these governments, I think, to help ease the burden of these price rises on consumers so it doesn't even further widen that feeling that, that somehow democracy is not delivering, that, that democracy is only for uh, well-connected elites. And it puts a lot of pressure on local politicians to be really connected to the day-to-day -day lives and, and experiences of their people so that there isn't that kind of, that kind of disconnect. Well, since you mentioned France, uh, yeah. in the recent elections, uh, people uh, of France, French people, said they have to choose between uh, la peste et la colère. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Romania, uh, it's a country that uh, you always, or in the last couple of years, always choose between um, la peste et la colère, or in uh, between, uh, or they choose lesser uh, evil, let's say. Sure. Um, so if a country like France at some point will turn in the wrong way, what could happen of the European Union? Because France yeah. is the second uh, economic power of European Union. You can feel a collective sigh of relief all across the European Union, the transatlantic family that, that Emmanuel Macron was re-elected as president. There, I think one has to be concerned at the degree to which the political party structures in France have essentially fallen by the wayside. And what you see is personality-driven politics. Le Pen is a personality. Macron came out of nowhere as a personality. Even Mélenchon has really destroyed traditional parties on the left and built sort of something around himself, which is fundamentally somewhat populist in nature. Macron won't be here in five more years. Uh, the far right probably will be in some way. And so it is, it is a real question. Uh, we'll see now what happens in the legislative elections, how Enjoy. Macron is able to actually govern. Um, I'm very skeptical that he can do so in collaboration with what is an increasingly radicalized uh, left in France. So it is, it is a huge question. I think the European Union would have looked very different. Uh, transatlantic policy towards Russia would likely have looked very different if Marine Le Pen had won. So uh, certainly everyone was watching France very carefully in, in Germany last year. Um, but I think, I will say this, people say la peste et la colère, but people also had a right in the first round to go out and express themselves for more candidates than, than we typically have. For example, in the, in the United States, there's a primary system, but you, you go and get to vote for two candidates. And in France, uh, for people who would denigrate they democracy, they had, they had so many choices in the first round, perhaps less in the second round, uh, but they did have a choice. And some citizens chose not to express themselves, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, the problem we see now in Europe, in different countries, it was a problem for the United States as well when it comes to, uh, to politics. Why don't politicians seem to you know, discover faster these problems that people have? I think, well, that's an interesting question. It, it gets to whether politicians perhaps spend too much time in national capitals debating legislation, not enough time with their constituents, or, or politicians in some ways um, too maybe in office too long and they lose touch. We've seen this with some senators in the United States who, you know, start to become very comfortable in Washington, D.C., spend more of their time there, get very comfortable on the cocktail circuit, and they really forget about the needs of, of farmers in Indiana. Despite their best efforts, they become a little bit disconnected. So that certainly is a challenge. I think that we do see, not just at the political level, but one of the things I noticed about my country prior, prior to, to leaving here and I don't think it's probably unique to the United States is the degree to which just different classes fundamentally no longer understand each other generally. So mm -hmm. a Trump voter uh, in a place like Indiana has so little in common about what they eat, what they read, what they watch on television, um, the kind of even sports they watch, the clothes they wear with somebody who lives in New York City and is, is really progressive. So we fundamentally were misunderstanding each other as a society. And I think politicians fall into some of that same trap. And it's a danger, to me, it's a really dangerous um, element in our societies. It's driven by social media and other things that results in less of a national cohesion, less of a feeling that we're part of some sort of democratic experiment and some sort of national experiment, which is fundamentally what America is. It's, a, it's almost a great gamble against the, the millennia of history of how societies function themselves that a number of other countries are attempting that great experiment as well. So it is a risk. Well, if this uh, uh, gap between uh, various layers of societies is increasing, do you think we will witness the same gap of, um, I don't know, misunderstanding when it comes to countries of European Union? We see that Europe is uh, united for the moment, but also this unity is tested by Russia. And one example is the gas, cutting the gas and uh, working with the gas uh, to blackmail Europe. So do you think the solidarity will stand when the economies of those countries will start to have issues? 
I'm actually quite optimistic that they will. I think it will, Europe is going to hold together in this better than I think people might have expected. Macron's re-election is really important. Secondly, you're seeing Germany really struggle and wrestle with ideologies of the past that are not suited to the present, whether it's um, pacifism without any questions about pacifism and what mm -hmm. that actually means, and also questions about how the German taxpayers' money is or isn't working in terms of budget deficits and solidarity. Clearly, this is going to be very expensive. We're seeing right now the debate about oil sanctions. Hungary and Slovakia are deeply affected by that. Um, they have different approaches toward Russia, Hungary and Slovakia, but we're seeing a bit of a carve out for Hungary and Slovakia to move at a slower pace, signs of European solidarity. Uh, we're seeing growing interconnections amongst European countries, Greece playing an important role, gas coming from the south. I'm relatively optimistic Europe's going to hang together on this, but what I think we're going to need to see is Germany's going to be the key, um, and the, the landlocked countries of Europe are going to need the coastal countries to really step up so that they can help get the gas from liquefied natural gas and things like that. I think we'll need more flexibility in terms of budget because this is going to be very expensive for countries. And that 3% debt cap is not going to be sustainable on either defense spending or on energy transition. So I think we'll need to see creative lending and borrowing mechanisms like we saw during the pandemic for defense and for energy expenditures to allow countries to make the investments they need to be resilient. And what about digitalization? Because Europe has some examples when it comes to digital. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking, for instance, about Estonia or Denmark. Yeah. But then again, most of us are lacking behind uh, on this area. Why is it so hard for politicians, because the decision is theirs, to understand that digital is actually an advantage for, uh, for uh, the country's economies and not only? Well, I would say that the European Union, of course, has the Recovery and Resilience Fund, which has two, two really important pillars to it, right? Energy and digital. Yes, so but for that, you also need projects from each member state. That's the fundamental problem, right? We, we, the country that I'm living now, Slovakia, I think 56% of their Recovery and Resilience Funds were actually used in the last round of or, or the EU funds because they couldn't generate sufficient projects. It's a constant challenge, but that doesn't fall just on politicians. It also falls on the business community. And it falls, and this is where I think SIPE and our work really comes to the fore is helping bridge that gap between the private sector. Fundamentally, digitization projects are going to be driven by the private sector, both domestic tech entrepreneurs, also major tech platforms that are an indispensable part of that mix. And figuring out how business and can communicate what they're able to bring to the table, what their needs are. Uh, we're working uh, now with the Bulgarian Startup Association in Bulgaria. They're trying to make Bulgaria a more beneficial environment at, at the policy level for startups. I think we need more of that kind of leadership where the business community is organizing to push government to create the policies that they need to be successful, to advocate for their industries in Brussels. And I think that's digital is very hard for any of us to understand. Uh, we've seen regulators in the United States, politicians struggle enormously to understand the impact Facebook and other things are having on society. That's going to be true in any other country. That's where that business government dialogue is crucial to help bridge that gap. And do you think cybersecurity is also a problem since uh, the digitalization is so complicated? This could be even more complicated. I mean, we have yeah. even jokes in Romania that everything in our case or most of the work uh, is on files, literally files with paper. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think this could also be a problem for uh, politics to and business sector, why not, sure. to understand that we need still digitalization? It's a massive problem for both. If you digitize on poor cybersecurity, it's like building a house on sand. That's mm -hmm. the best analogy I think you can use. And, and it's a prevalent concern for politics, for business. Um, and again, this is tricky because a lot of the capacity lies in the hand of the private sector. If you look at Microsoft has been a crucial player in helping Ukraine uh, with cybersecurity. That's a capacity that it, it almost is akin to the big banks in the, in the early 1900s in America would have to loan, bail out the government. Uh, and the government, the U.S. and other governments have great cyber capability, but without the cooperation of big tech platforms uh, to fix patches or to help provide leadership, without companies reporting cyber breaches and having an effective dialogue with regulators, then we're not going to have an effective cybersecurity system. So as we digitize, if we don't do it with cybersecurity built in, we just create more vulnerabilities than we would have had before. Well, this is the century of technology, but right now we are witnessing a war that is mainly conducted in a very conventional way. Uh, 
Uh, we see lately uh, in Romania, for instance, uh, cyber attacks. We saw a lot of cyber attacks yeah. as well in the rest of Europe and, of course, in Ukraine. Why is still the world fighting conventionally when it could be easier to stop the world yeah. by cyber? Well, it's an interesting... I think deterrence is maybe holding... We've, we've seen, I think, probably more cyber... It's a heavily classified area for the U.S. and others. I think mm -hmm. we probably... There's more going on than we've seen, but we certainly haven't seen... Um, Western societies, NATO countries paralyzed by cyber attacks. I have to assume that there's some sort of deterrent effect that holds, similar to the use of nuclear weapons. If the Russians were to take down an American power grid very publicly, it invites all sorts of retaliation. So that's certainly one thing. I would say it looks like a conventional conflict in some ways. A big country invading a sovereign neighbor with tanks and things like that. But it's fundamentally a 21st century war in the use of drones, the degree to which um, the, the Ukrainians have leveraged drone power uh, to great effectiveness. Strategic communications, use of the internet, this is a war that's fought. Um, the communication side of it is crucial and has rallied the world, most of the world at least, it seems, around Ukraine's side by effective communication from the president, but also you know, effective memes and things you see on the internet of, of heroic Ukrainian resistance. And so it's a, it feels like a 20th century conflict in many ways, but it's very 21st century in some of these new tools that frankly the Ukrainians have been more adept at using than the Russians. Yes, but if Ukrainians, uh, let's say, win the informational war, they also win the hearts of the, uh, the rest of the world, uh, the Russians are winning the minds of uh, their own people. Yeah. And it's very difficult because the propaganda of Russia is deep yes. and uh, the roots are very deep. Uh, it's very difficult to communicate with the Russians. Uh, how can the West find a way to, I don't know, make itself much more understood by the Russian people? It's a very, very difficult question. I think our politicians have to be very careful about the words that they choose to use about this conflict. And I think here's where our political leaders are in a real conundrum. All wars end, and they usually end in some sort of diplomatic negotiation. And, and that's fundamentally for Ukraine to decide what that looks like. Um, some of the language, I think one has to be careful to not give the Russian government even more um, of a narrative to build around victimization and being sort of surrounded as an enemy while still ensuring that, that Ukraine fundamentally prevails in the conflict. It's a very sensitive thing. You're right, the Ukrainian or the Russian uh, information space is a total black box. One interesting avenue to pursue is sort of the Russian diaspora community, Russians outside of Russia who have access to free information but are still communicating with Russians via telegram. There are those kinds of means and there's a significant and growing Mm -hmm. uh, exodus of Russians leaving the country that is an opportunity to think about a different future for Russia. But in the meantime, in the, the present war footing, we'll see an even more hostile rhetoric and perhaps more of a mobilization of the public around the war. The last question must be about diplomacy since it's yeah. the diplomatic passport uh, and you mentioned diplomacy. We will have uh, definitely a long war. This yeah. is the, the premises, the, this is the, um, the announce. But uh, do you think that uh, the West at some point will um, rebuild its relationship with Russia? Can Russia, after all this um, situation, still be considered a, a trustful state? No, not the current Russian regime. I mean, history is long, right? So if you look back, of course, at some point, the West will, reckon, will have relations with Russia. The Russia like this that we see, uh, that acts like this, it's, it's difficult to have normal functioning relations. It's important not to break off the relationship entirely. I think what Emmanuel Macron does in terms of talking to Putin, he's had a lot of, frankly, embarrassing moments where the Russians have given him nothing. But it's important to note the Ukrainians have asked Macron to have that dialogue. We have to keep that channel open. The war must end at some point. We don't want this to turn into some sort of awful nuclear exchange or something like that. And the Russians are going to remain a member of the permanent uh, UN Security, yes, Security Council. So one will be not having fruitful discussions with them, but they will be at the table. So there, we have to think in the long term and then in the shorter and medium term. Uh, but right now, Russia is clearly not a trustworthy member of the international community of nations. One thing that's worth reflecting on for our democratic societies is how much of the world has sat on the fence, including other democracies like India, uh, the Gulf states. And I think that's going to require really creative diplomacy. Those countries have their own dependencies on Russia. Some countries are very concerned about the sanctions regime that could this be used to, to punish their countries.
So I think we'll have to really think about how to build an inclusive tent, um, make it maybe less about, um, more about the, the rules that have been broken here, a country invading a sovereign neighbor, uh, than making it, we must not turn it into a thing where it's the West versus the rest, but about rules that have been broken that, that can't be acceptable in the international system, similar to what President Bush, the father, did when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. Uh, that was a rule at the end of the Cold War that, that shouldn't be allowed to be broken, and I think we have to say the same about invading a sovereign country and the kind of war crimes that we've seen committed. Jeff Lightfoot, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. Atât pentru astăzi, dar rămânem în continuare online pe pagina de Facebook a emisiunii și pe contul nostru de Twitter. Revenim cu subiecte noi din lumea diplomației și a politicii externe, vinerea viitoare de la 11.30 și reloare sâmbăta după miezul nopții.